So today I want to open your Bibles to the book of Mark. It's in the, old, in the New Testament. There's Matthew and then there's Mark. So we're going to read from the book of Mark, chapter 2. <clears throat> so I know that many of you are very sleepy, uh, but I hope that you will realize that it's a very important time to listen to the Word of God. So actually, <clears throat> many people, you know, I know that you are very sleepy, but you have to think about it this way. You know, if there was a fire here that started erupting right in the middle of this auditorium, many of you will be out of the building in less than two seconds, right? And none of you will probably think about me. All of you will probably be gone. See you, Pastor Terry, in heaven later. But that means actually you're not that tired. You can overcome this, okay? So if you entertain the idea that I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, then you will continually be tired. But there are ways to overcome it because actually, if I were to play a movie, many of you will probably wake up really quick. So let's concentrate and hopefully we'll be able to listen to the Word of God. So in Matthew, in Mark, Mark, Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, we're going to start reading. Oh, sorry, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. We're going to start reading Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm going to start reading from verse 35. Mark chapter 5, starting from verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. We read up to verse 43. <clears throat> All right, everyone. <clears throat> How many of you made a promise before? Okay, good. Now, here's the thing. We're going to talk about this. <clears throat> before you make a promise, let's say, for example, I promise to meet you uh, at 4 p.m. outside the front door. Now, before I make a promise, there are a few things that have to start answered, that has, that has to happen. So before I actually give you a promise, what's the first thing I must do? If I make a promise to meet you at 4 p.m. outside of the main entrance there, what's the first thing I have to think about? So what? My schedule, right? So I have to think about, am I able to make it? And if I'm able to make it, the second thing is also has to happen. What is that? Say what? Yeah, the other person's schedule. Can that person make it? Another thing I have to think about, how am I going to get here? Another thing I have to think about, when I get here, what are we going to do? So there's a lot of things that go into making a promise. It's not just something that we do very often where we speak and give a promise. But in order for us to make a promise, there's a lot of things that we have to think about. But then there's another thing, like right? let's say I give you another kind of promise. Oh, I promise that I'm going to give you a million dollars, right? Now, when you think about that kind of promise, now what has to happen? Number one, I actually have to have a million dollars, right? If I don't have a million dollars, I can't promise you anything. Number two, another thing I need, I actually have to have a heart of wanting to give it to you, right? All right. So those two things have to be met. So if you think about it, when you make a promise, when you make a promise, you already think about those things and then you speak. 
people who are not trustworthy, there are people who do not prepare those things. So when I give a promise and say, oh, I'll be here at four, but I never check my schedule. And let's say I don't even have a car. And let's say I have no way to get there. But if I still make a promise and I have no ability to fulfill that promise, that is irresponsible. And then what happens? I will break that promise, right? So this is the difference. Now, when you look at God, if you look at the Bible, many people don't know how to read the Bible. Most people read the Bible as a manual saying, you have to do this and do that. Do this and do that. Do this and do that. But actually, the Bible is God's contract, God's written promise to all of us. Everything that God has put inside of this Bible is something that he has to actually keep. So most people, when they see things like, be righteous, be ye righteous, we think, oh, that means God is telling me that I have to live righteously, I have to try hard and become righteous, I have to stop sinning, I have to do this, I have to do this. But actually, that is wrong. Now think about this. Depending on what heart you have, that is how you see things. So important thing is most people have the wrong mindset when they approach God. They have the wrong idea of who God is. They believe that God is very demanding. God says, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. But actually, if you really think about it, that doesn't make much sense. And the reason why I'll explain it to you. <clears throat> when I go, I have four kids. I mentioned this before four children and I remember you know when I take my kids to McDonald's that's when you realize that four kids is a lot of kids yeah when you used to go to McDonald's by yourself you didn't really realize but when you have four kids I mean when you have four kids and you you know you're in the room together you know like I have my, my two youngest daughters Leia and Laura and my youngest daughter Laura she likes to sing in the car and like she makes up her own songs like traffic light songs like the light turn red and she just starts singing in the car and those things like wow just made me feel all oh, my kids are so cute oh my god I have four kids I'm so happy I have four kids oh maybe I should have five or six but then you go to McDonald's and you go dude why do I have four and especially when it comes to world camp I have to pay four kids tuition <laughs> So everyone, think about it. <clears throat> when I have my four children and I go to McDonald's, when I go to McDonald's, do I tell my kids, hey, it's McDonald's time. My kids are like, yay. Okay, this time, you paying. Now, if I did that, what would happen? Hey, kids, McDonald's time. My kids are like, no, nah, we're good. We're straight. We don't need none of that. No, that's unhealthy, bad. That's very, very unhealthy. You should try less carbs, right? Everyone think about it. Am I going to demand my kids pay for everything? No. Why? I'm the father. I'm not going to let my kids pay. And first of all, I know none of my kids have jobs. And they broke. Because I know they broke, that's why I have money. That's why I'm going to pay for it, isn't it? Isn't it? So look at God and look at you. Remember I told you about it, right? If I'm going out and there's my friend, Lendo, and I just slap him in the face. And he goes, Pastor, why'd you do that? Oh, I don't know. Something wrong with my hand. It's like a weird jerk reaction. Sorry, forgive me. I promise I won't do it again. But then the next day I see him and I slap him again. Pastor, that's twice. Yeah, I know, I can count too, but I, don't, I can't stop. I don't know what's coming over me. And then the next day, I slap him again. And I slap him again. Let's say I slap him ten times. Soon he's going to realize, Pastor Terry likes slapping me. I don't think I should meet Pastor Terry. And if he does talk to me, he's probably going to talk to me on the phone or across the street, at least away from my right hand, right? Because you cannot trust Pastor Terry because every time Pastor Terry sees me, he just slaps me. Now think about this. You tell yourself, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to sin. God goes. <clears throat> Why? Because God knows it's not that we lack the effort. I'm pretty sure you've tried very hard. 
But we are people who are unable to fulfill that, right? So I'm not going to go to McDonald's expecting my eight-year-old daughter to pay for everybody because I know she doesn't have a job. She doesn't have the money. Why would I expect that of her? I don't tell my kids, hey, my next car payment you may get. Why? Because number one, that's my responsibility. Number two, I know my kids don't have that ability to take care of it. So I'm not, it's not, it's not even popping, it's not even an idea. It's not even an option. It doesn't even enter my mind. And think about it. I love my children, right? So far, they're still there. Haven't gotten rid of them. Thought about it a lot, but never did it. But think about it. I love my children. Now, let's say my daughter, my daughter needs, you know, go to college later. Oh, when I think about our world camp fee and then think about college, four kids. Okay, anyway, let's, that's another story. So let's say I have a million dollars in my bank. If my daughter has to go to college, you don't think I want to pay? You don't think I'm excited to do it? Why? I can do it. I can do something for my daughter. I'm going to be all excited. Am I right? And I'm going to want to pay for it. I'm going to want to take care of it. I'm going to want to do it. Why? Because that's my daughter. So now if you look at the heart of God, when God makes us a promise, who is he really expecting to fulfill the promise? It doesn't make sense if he knows that we can't even keep our New Year's resolutions. Why is God going to expect us to keep the promise? Right? Look at me. I've been on a diet for 20 years. Every January, 10 pounds, baby. 20 pounds, baby. But the problem is, I meant losing. But for some reason, it's more like gaining. Maybe I have to be more specific in my New Year's resolution and not just name the number. 20 pounds, baby. My body goes, all right, let's get it. <clears throat> But everyone, think about it. How many times have you proposed your heart not to lie and you still lie? Everyone, you have to realize something. When God looks at us, he does not see us the same way we see us. Now, when you look at yourself, we have a very, we have a problem. Now, it's not like, some people are like that. Some people have that arrogant, like, dude, I am an angel. Look at his face. This is perfect. Some people think that. So people think that everything they do is great. But most people do not think that. But most people, they have another heart that's just the same, actually. The only difference is in how they express it. But the other heart that you have is, I'm okay. I'm good enough. Not bad. Not good. Not bad. Not great. I'm all right. That heart itself is just as negative as the heart of like, ooh, I'm the greatest. Why? Because the problem is we're unable to see ourselves in the right way. So if God and us are standing together and God is our Father, we have a problem that we cannot take care of, of course we're going to try. But who's waiting there to actually take care of it? So when you think about God and us, the relationship and the mindset that we have is completely different and wrong in front of the heart of God. When God says, be ye righteous, you know what that means? That means, I'm going to make you righteous, accept it. That's what that means. When I tell my sons, hey, let's go eat McDonald's, that doesn't mean, hey, you have to pay for it. Now, if we're an adult, if I'm an adult and I say, hey, we're going to go to a restaurant, let's go eat some steak, that means I'm expecting the adult to pay for the adult self. But the important thing is, if it's my children... And I have the ability to pay, I'm going to pay for it. Nothing. And what am I going to tell them? I'm going to say, hey, eat whatever you want. Choose whatever you like on this menu. So with that heart, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to take responsibility for it because that's what I am. I am the father. So when you read the Bible, how do we have to read it? You have to read it with the understanding that everything God says in here is something that he wants to fulfill. It's something that he is going to do, not me. Do you understand? Do you understand? So, for example, what we read here today <clears throat> is a man named Jairus who had a daughter. Now, in Jairus' life, you know, a daughter is very important. A daughter is very precious. 
So what did he do? When the daughter was sick, he ran to Jesus to ask Jesus to help his daughter. Why? Because his daughter was sick. And then, you know, he probably went to doctors. He probably tried medicine. That didn't work. Nothing worked. So then when he heard about Jesus who can heal people, the first thing he did was run to Jesus and ask Jesus for help, right? But on his way to go helping his daughter, what happened? His daughter died. So Jesus heard from Jairus, hey, come help my daughter. Jesus says, I will go. Let's go to your house. I'll follow you. Lead the way. While they were going, Jairus' daughter died. So while Jairus' daughter died, what happened was one of Jairus' servants ran from the house, ran to Jairus and said, sir, master, you don't need to bring Jesus anymore. Don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. I'm sorry, she's dead. There's no need to make him come to the house. Now there are two things that we're going to look at right here. The first thing is, the first thing is, when you look at the father's heart, and you look at all the people's heart there, they went to Jesus, and when they went to Jesus, they went to Jesus when she was sick. Because when a person is sick, there's still some kind of hope that that person can be healed, right? That's why they went to Jesus, because they had a hope. Hey, Jesus healed a blind man. Jesus made a crippled man walk. Oh, that means Jesus could probably heal my daughter. That is when they went to Jesus. But then what happened? Something else happened. Hey, when, I, when he went to Jesus, isn't things supposed to start to get better? But importantly, instead of getting better, it actually grew worse. Why? Because when they went to Jesus, as Jesus was going, the daughter died. Now, when the daughter died, that's when the servant came and says, you don't need to call Jesus anymore. Why did the servant say that? Because in your mind and in my mind, most people's mind, death is final. Am I right? Am I right? So if death is final, there's nothing more we can do. Right? And that is in the center of everybody's heart. Now, this is very important. Why did they have that despair? Why? Why were they living in that darkness and that pain and that despair? Jesus is there, right? But another thing is, Jesus was following Jairus to Jairus' house. Why is Jesus following Jairus to his house? Why? Because Jesus wants to heal his daughter, right? Jesus wants to go, and Jesus wants to work, and Jesus wants to do it. For Jesus to heal Jairus' daughter is nothing. But then there comes a point where the daughter died. When the daughter died, Jairus was thinking in his heart, Oh, she's dead. It's over. There's no need to come anymore. It's done. Sorry, Jesus. I know you're busy, but... That's it. Now, this heart came because people, people, they know their limit. When someone dies, the only thing we have left to do is to cry, to mourn, to have a funeral. That's the only option we have left. But then what did Jesus say? No, don't be afraid. Only believe. Let's go. He still went to Jairus' house. The reason why he still went to Jairus' house was because what? Because for Jesus... He's still able to work. If a doctor, if it was a doctor, and the person says, hey, doctor, come look at my daughter. My daughter is sick. Can you take a look? He'll come. But on the way, if they say, oh, sorry, doctor, she has died already. The doctor's not going to be able to do anything. The doctor's going to say, oh, I'm so sorry. If you would have let me know earlier, maybe I could have tried to help. But once the child is dead, a doctor's work is done. There's nothing more he can do. So he would not even, he would probably say, oh, I'm sorry. And he probably would not go to Jairus' house. But Jesus is still willing to go to Jairus' house. I told you, before I make a promise, I have to think, is it possible? Before I make my promise, I have to consider, do I have the ability to fulfill that promise? If I'm going to say, I want to meet you at 4 p.m. outside of the door, first of all, I have to make sure my schedule is cleared. Second of all, I have to actually make sure I have transportation to get there. Am I right? 
And if I promise to give someone a million dollars, I have to consider, do I have the million dollars? Do I want to give her that million dollars? Those are things that I have to have fulfilled first before I can make a promise. So think about it. Before Jesus is saying something, hey, do not be afraid. Only believe. Before he can say something, that means Jesus already has to consider a lot of things. A lot of things have to already be decided. So in the Bible, it talks about how Jesus says that I've never said anything. I've never done anything of my own will. Everything I've said, everything I've done is what my Father showed me to say, is what my Father showed me to do. Everybody understand? Now why is this important? This is important because for Jesus to say, be not afraid, only believe, that means number two, two things. Number one, Jesus has to have the power to bring the daughter back to life. And two, he has to know the will of God, that God is going to bring her back to life. Those two things must be completely fulfilled in order for Jesus to open his mouth and say, be not afraid, only believe. So the fact that Jesus is telling Jairus, hey, take me to your house, that is something that's very amazing. You can see the clear heart of God. Now this is how the Bible works. Okay, listen very carefully. This is how the Bible works. How many of you like movies? Right? Now, did you hear that when Avengers Endgame first came out, how much money it made, right? Did you know Avengers Endgame beat Avatar as the biggest money-making movie in world history? Uh, some of you are proud, huh? <clears throat> but you know, actually, the interesting thing is, I read on a newspaper article, of course, I didn't see it in the theater, because I only read the Bible. <clears throat> so I heard on a newspaper, I watched the news, it goes, one man put into ICU at Avengers Endgame. I was like, what, he got so excited he had a heart attack? What, what happened? So I read the article. So for some stupid reason, this guy thought it would be really, really funny because he already saw it. He, like, saw the first showing, the very first opening night he went, he saw the movie. But he wanted to watch it again. So he thought it would be hilarious if I just jump up at the front of the movie and tell the end to everybody in the theater. So these guys fill the theater. It's packed, sold out. And this guy, right during the, you know, those commercials where they show the previews of the other movies that are coming out later, he jumps up, he goes, hey, everybody, this and this happens at the end. And this and this person dies. Everybody in the theater beat him up so bad that he went to ICU. No. Yeah. But he deserved it, though. I mean, all these people waited in line, got all their tickets, got all this excitement, and he going to do that? Yeah. He deserved drinking through a straw, that's what I say. For everyone, there are different kinds of movies, right, that you like, right? You like scary movies, action movies, comedies, right? But let's say, for example, you want to watch a scary movie. You watch a scary movie. Now, scary movies used to scare me, but now they annoy me. When I was a kid, I used to be really scared. I remember watching Nightmare on Elm Street in elementary school when it first came out. That was the scariest movie ever because... At least the other monsters kill you in your real life. But this one killed you when you sleep. That's just wrong. Are you serious, dude? Like while I'm sleeping? And if you died in your dream, you died in real life. That's just messed up. Because sometimes you sleep in and when you dream, you're too tired to do anything. But this scared me. But then now... I'm older. I'm like 41 now. So now when I watch scary movies, I see all the idiot things that these people do. And they deserve to die, in my opinion. You just heard a weird noise in your closet. Sounds like an animal getting eaten by another animal. 
And for some stupid reason, that guy go, what is that? And got to open the door. When I see that, I'm like, dude, did you not hear the strange noise? But they go, oh, what is that? They saw a dead person hanging in the garage with a knife in his chest. And some strange person walks in the woods in the middle of the night. He got to go, who's there? Are you kidding me? The moment you see that woman, I'm on my cell phone calling the FBI. I'm calling everybody. There's going to be helicopters all over the place. And the only thing you're thinking, I know, I don't know if you think of it. The only thing I think is, why don't you just get in your car and go to Jamaica or something? Right? Go to the airport, buy a ticket. It's not that expensive, especially if you leave through Miami. It's very cheap. You go there and go to Jamaica, and let's see if Jason follows you there. It's a little hot because he's overdressed. But every time I see these scary movies, it's always that way. And you know the way the scary movie works? The music changes when somebody's about to die, right? It goes, and all of a sudden it goes, ee, 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 ee. And then and on your mind, it's like, dude, don't you hear the background music? Don't you know you're about to die? And then for some strange reason, when they open that door, they got to turn the doorknob all slow. And there's like two cameras. One camera shows the guy's hand turning the doorknob. The other camera's on the other side of the door watching the doorknob turn. And it's all slow. I was like, nobody opens a door to anything. Slow. They open it. And you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. The music's going, ee, ee, ee. And you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you're like, ee, 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 uh-huh. And you go, oh, my God, oh my God she's going she gonna to die. And then your friend goes, oh, don't, don't worry. She don't die here. How do you feel? Dude, you're like, shut up. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. The monster's right behind the door. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. She lives. So think about it, everyone. How can a person who already seen the movie and the person who has not seen the movie, how can their hearts be the same? They cannot be the same. A person who's never seen it, they go, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But then your friend who already saw it goes, oh, don't worry, she lives to the end. So we're all stressed out, but the friend already saw the end, so he looks at us and he's like kind of amused, right? But then in our lives, sometimes we think, oh, God, oh, God, it's impossible. I'm going to die. I'm going to, oh, my God, it's over. God goes, no, you're not. You're going to live. So I used to think about it. Why is it that it seems like whenever I'm in, like, my most difficult situation, it seems like I'm urgent. I'm all, like, about to go, oh, my God, it's so terrible. But then God that doesn't seem like he's worried at all. And when I pray, God, please help me, please help me now. I need it now. I need the money now. I need this now. I need this now. Please help me. And what do we think? Oh, my God, if you don't help me, oh, my God, it's over. But God goes, oh, don't worry. You're not going to die here. It's not that God does not care. It's that God is not worried because he already saw the movie. Do you understand? He's already seen how he's going to work. He already seen it. So when Jesus sees this girl, Jairus' his daughter is dead. Everybody's like, oh, my God, it's over. No, no, it's over. And all they're doing is crying. But Jesus says, hey, don't worry. Why are you crying? Why? Because Jesus already saw the end of the movie. Jesus already knows what he's going to do. Jesus already seen this girl 20 years later, married with children, living a happy life. Jesus sees that film, and that's why when he looks at the current situation, he's not worried. When we look at the situation, it seems impossible. It's not going to work. Nothing's going to happen. Look, I'm going to fail. Look, she's dead. It's over. But the difference between God's heart and my heart is so different. Why? Because when God looks at her, he already sees she's alive. She already has 10, you know, two children. She's there 10 years later. She's already living with, you know, 20 years later. She's already living this life. She's going to live a happy life. So when God sees the current situation, it doesn't bother him like it bothers us. Do you understand? So when God looks at you, before he says anything in this Bible, God already seen the outcome. God has already seen the work. God has already fulfilled the promise. God has already decided his heart. And God already knows that he can fulfill these promises. And that's why he gave them to us. So when Jesus looked at Jairus' his daughter, he says, no, she is not dead, but she is asleep. Some of you 
sleeping right now, look like you're dead. You have mouth open, flies going in and out. Some of you, your eyes open, right? Like halfway. So when I first got married to my wife, my wife was shocked because my eyes are huge. Right now you can't see them because my thick glasses make my eyes look small. But if I take off my glasses, you'll see my eyes are big. So my eyelids do not close all the way when I sleep. They're like 50% open. So when my wife first got, when we first got married, she didn't know that. It's not something I put on my, you know, Twitter account. Hey, my eyes are open only halfway. So when my wife saw me, she didn't know. So she was talking to me like I was awake. The good news is I don't snore. So when I sleep, I was kind of like normal. So she looked at me, she's like talking to me, and she asked me a couple questions I didn't answer. So she hit me. I said, like, what? What you hit me for? Why didn't you answer my question? I said, like, what question? I was sleeping, woman. She's like, you were sleeping? I was like, yeah. Didn't you see my eyes closed? She's like, your eyes don't close. I was like, dude, I didn't even know that. So she took a picture. I was like, dude, that is kind of freaky. <clears throat> so my, mom, my wife only had one rule. There's only one rule in our relationship. I was like, was that I sleep first. So everyone, think about it. Even though you may look like you're dead, but think about it. What's the difference between sleeping and dead? Sleeping, eventually, you're going to what? It don't matter how long you sleep. How is the longest you've ever slept? What's the longest you ever laid in bed? 10 hours? 12 hours? I once laid in bed 21 hours. I'll tell you right now, about the 15th hour, you have to propose your heart to sleep. There's no more sleep left. You have to force it. You, know, you better go to sleep right now. That's how hard it is. And even though you lay down, you're like still thinking about all this other stuff. Stop. Sleep. Dude, after 20, and 21 hours, your ribs hurt. Your back hurts and your body is like, get up. It's hard to sleep 21 hours. So that's what I'm saying. I didn't actually sleep for the 21 hours. I think I slept for like 12 and I just forced myself to stay in bed for another like 15. Everyone. No matter how tired you are, if you're just sleeping, eventually you're going to what? Wake up. So I thought, oh, that's why Jesus is saying this word. She is not dead, but she is sleeping. Why? Because in Jesus' mind, what are you crying for? In about a couple minutes, she's going to do what? She's going to wake up. So when Jesus said, hey, she's not dead, she's sleeping, everybody's like, dude, this dude is on some kind of alcohol. He's doing something. Who is this guy? Think about it. when a person dies, what were you, what, in every movie when someone dies, what do they do? They check the pulse, right? Check the breathing, right? That's what doctors do too. When someone's not breathing, they check the pulse, they check the pupil, they even put the light in the eye to see if it dilates or not, and then they check the pulse, they do blood pressure, do all kinds of things to check and confirm and then confirm again and then confirm again that the person is dead, right? The difference between that is these people did the same thing. When a young girl dies, you look, okay, okay, eyes half open. I think she did. Let's bury her. If my wife did that, that would be very terrible, wouldn't it? So that's what my wife does. In order to test to see if I'm awake or not, what she do? She hit me. So don't you think that the people there, they're checking this girl, shaking her, wake up, wake up checking her breathing, checking her pulse, checking her heartbeat. And after checking, and then checking again, and then checking again, and then checking again, they confirmed four or five different ways that she is dead. Do you understand? Now, the difference is when Jesus says she is sleeping, people's idea, people's understanding of the word sleeping, it started to conflict. What Jesus is thinking and what the people are thinking are so different that it cannot match. And that's why the people have no other choice but to despise Jesus, to reject Jesus' words, to not accept it, because it doesn't make sense. What he's saying is ridiculous. 
But actually what Jesus is telling them are words of hope. Isn't it good that she's only sleeping? Isn't it good news that she's only sleeping? By saying she's sleeping, Jesus is saying that she's going to what? Wake up. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm going to wake her up. She's going to wake up. Just wait a minute. She's only sleeping. It's only temporary. That's what God, that's what Jesus is saying. This is good news. But because it doesn't match their heart, people even started getting angry. People even started despising Jesus. People even started ridiculing Jesus in their heart, rejecting Jesus, even though Jesus is trying to take care of their problem, simply because it doesn't match their heart. It doesn't match what they think is right, and it doesn't make sense. Because of that, they just despise Jesus. And even though Jesus is there to help, they cannot receive that help. Do you understand? Actually, there's nothing that can block us from receiving the grace of God, but there's one thing when we close our heart by trusting our thought. Now, closing your heart doesn't mean, oh, I hate you. That's one form of closing your heart. But closing your heart is very simple. When I think that I am correct and there's nothing more for me to gain, that's closing your heart. If I look at someone and go, hey, I already see this. Oh, it's done. It's finished. That is closing your heart. Closing your heart is believing what you see is everything. When you believe what you see is everything, no more things to learn, then your heart is closed already. So even though Jesus is saying, no, she's sleeping, what are you talking about? She's dead. I checked. I checked her pulse. I checked her breathing. I checked her heartbeat. She's dead. That's it. There's no more need to confirm. I know for sure that she is dead. That already closed their heart to Jesus. So no matter what Jesus said, it could not enter their heart. But then Jesus is saying this because what Jesus sees is very different. You and I cannot see what happens five minutes later. You and I, does not. there's a whole world that we do not see. Am I right? But what God lives in, the world that Jesus sees, is very different than what we see. Once, <clears throat> you know, as you know, many of you came late and that's not your fault. That was like, because we chartered a bus company. So we have a company that we work with that we decided this year. So last year we ran, I think we ran school buses. This year we decided to have a little bit more comfortable seats instead of a school bus. Because some kids hate school so much they started having trauma when they saw the yellow school bus. So what we did is, like, oh my God, are we going to world camp? Are we going back to school? So they were confused. So we decided to have charter buses. You know, the 50 seat tour buses that have comfortable seats and they're not yellow. So we talked to the manager, the manager's like, oh, don't worry, we'll be on time, we'll be in the room, we'll be late. And they're late yesterday and they're late today, right? Yeah, so I think I'm going to have to go to the manager and hit him over the head with a charter. But everyone, you see the 55 passenger bus, right? How many of you are bus drivers? Raise your hand. All right, let me ask you a question, another question then. Do you think it's easy to drive that bus? Many of you probably think, dude, I don't think I can drive that bus. Did you know I had the same thought? The exact same thought. So <clears throat> in New York Church, all of our pastors, pretty much almost all of our pastors, we all have bus driver's license. We had to get it because we have the U.S. Christmas Cantata Tour. So we had to do 25 cities, right? We can't hire outside drivers. So in order to save money, our pastors got driver's license. So I have a bus driver's license. And then we needed to drive 53-foot tractor-trailer trucks to deliver the actual set pieces and equipment, right? Well, we can't hire outside drivers for that too, so I have a truck driver's license too. But I remember the first time I got it, our head pastor, Pastor Yonggu Park, says, Terry, do you want to get a bus driver's license too? Because at that time we only had one bus, and Pastor Joseph Park, the translator for Pastor Oksu Park, and Pastor Yonggu Park, they both got bus driver's licenses before me. So they got the license. Now in my mind, I know Pastor Yonggu Park is a very good driver. So I thought, ah, oh, bus drivers have to have good sense, they have to have good instincts, they have to be really good at driving. So he asked me, Terry, Pastor Terry, do you want to get a bus driver's license? I'm like, no, I don't need it. I'm good. 
And then later he goes, get it. I'm like, yes, sir. But then he kept telling me, it's nothing. It's okay. You can do it. You'll be able to pass the test. Don't worry. You can do it. I was like, Pastor John. In my mind, I was thinking, oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, amen. Hallelujah. But inside my heart, I was thinking, I don't think so. I can't even drive a car well. What do you mean I'm driving a bus? But then this is what I'm saying. This is the heart that I had. I had that heart even while I was taking the bus driver's driver's test. But I got a license. I passed the driver's test. You know how I passed the driver's test? We went to the driving test. We wait. Now what happens is you go through like a instruction, like a, a teaching. You have to go through like an academy. So you go, you find a place, you take a few lessons. They provide the bus. And then the state, the, the Department of Transportation will provide the inspector who will run the test. So I go there. The bus comes, the bus is there. I'm there. But the instructor is not there. The one who takes the test, the one who's going to evaluate me, he's not there. We wait an hour and he didn't show up yet. So finally, we called, we called the Department of Transportation, we called that office, he goes, whoa, really, he's not there? And then that manager called the instructor on the cell phone. The instructor forgot there was a test. So he came an hour and 10 minutes late. He was so sorry. He was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I was like, it's okay. It's, okay. it's cool, dude. So we got in, and he was so sorry that he only let me do half the driving test. And I made a mistake. There's like this thing where you push the bre brakes. If the, if the uh, air pressure in the brakes drops to a certain point, there's something, there's a warning flag that drops down. It's called the wigwag. So it's a red little flag. So what you do is you test your brakes, you test your brakes, and it falls out, and the emergency brakes lock in, and then you have to test the emergency brakes before you begin. So then what happens is then you turn on the engine, the gas, the air tanks fill up, and then the gas, once the air tanks fill up, the, the emergency brake releases, and then everything's back to normal, and you're supposed to put the wigwag back into the original position. But I forgot. I did the whole driving test with that thing just dangling right in front of me. But then when I got out, you know what my test score was? 100%. I had a perfect test. Why? Because he was one hour late. He was so sorry he didn't mark any of my mistakes. I know I made a few. Like I forgot to turn my blinker on once, turn when changing the left lane. That's supposed to be minus something. But he was so sorry that he gave me a 100% score. But everyone, think about this. When Pastor Yongopar told me, get a bus driver's license, I can't. No, you can't. No, I can't. No, you can't. No, I'm not good enough. You can do it. Oh, I can't. You have to have a special skill. No, you have to do this. He said, no, anybody can do it. I didn't believe him. But actually, who is more qualified to make that decision? I never even took the test before. I never even drove a bus before. How do I know what is possible or impossible? I don't know. But then I believed in myself. And because I believed in myself, I closed my heart. So no matter what he told me, I always believed that it's not going to work. 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 But he got the driver's test. He went through the written test. He went through the driving test. He did the practice. He did the lessons. He got the license. And he's been driving more than a year. So who knows more, he or me? He knows it better than me. So if he says it's possible, then is it possible or not? So if I am going to, so this is the whole point of everything. If I think I'm correct, and if I think I'm smarter, if I think I'm more correct than him, then his words will not enter my heart, and his words cannot work, and then I'll always believe that it's impossible to get a driver's license. But I'm telling you right now, anybody can get it. Anybody can drive a bus. And I've been doing it for like over five years already, five, six, seven years. So this is what the problem is. When we look at Jesus and Jesus says, I have made you righteous, we look at it and go, no, I've tried. I've never stopped sinning. Look, I'm sinning right now. How can you say I'm righteous? It doesn't make sense, Jesus. That means you're telling Jesus you are more correct than he is. He's the wrong one and I'm the right one. Do you understand? 
So Jesus says, no, she is not dead. She is sleeping. Jesus, you don't know the difference between a dead person and a sleeping person. I tried. I touched her pulse. No pulse. I checked the heartbeat. No heartbeat. She's not breathing. She's dead. You don't know the difference, Jesus, between dead and sleeping? Do you think Jesus don't? Jesus knows. But what Jesus is saying is very different than what the people are hearing. So the people, because they see her, they touched her, they heard her, they did everything, all their five senses told them that she is dead, so they end up rejecting the word of God. They end up rejecting the will of God. Even though that will of God is to bless them, even though that will of God is to end their sorrow, end their darkness, end their pain, Jesus came there to make this girl come back to life, but even though he came there with that heart, people are seeing Jesus as mocking them. People are seeing Jesus as something that's annoying. People are seeing Jesus as something they want to reject. Why? Even though Jesus is there to help them. This is what we mean by closing our hearts. Closing our heart has nothing to do with evil intentions so much, but closing our heart is when we believe that everything we see is it, when we believe everything that we feel is correct, then what happens? Then we have no choice but to close our heart. But before Jesus says, oh no, she is not dead, she is sleeping. Do not be afraid, only believe. Before Jesus can say this, that means Jesus has already seen the end result. Jesus already knows that he has the power to do it and he has the heart to do it. He knows this. That is why he is not crying. Everybody else is crying. Everybody else is crying and suffering and in pain and sorrow and misery only because of one reason. They don't know what Jesus knows. They don't see what Jesus sees. If they could see and know what Jesus knows, their heart would change. If you're watching the scary movie and the person's about to open the door and you think, oh my God, is he going to die? And the friend who already saw it says, oh, don't worry. He's not going to die here. You may be annoyed, but at least you're not afraid that he's going to die anymore. That fear disappears. That fear does not exist anymore. So if you look at the word of God, oh, am I going to fail? Oh, am I gonna, my life is going to end? Oh, is it going to be over? The prophet says, no, do not fear. I am with you. Then you can know that it doesn't matter what happens then. I will not die. Do you understand? So what is God trying to show us? <coughs> Let's take a look here. If you look in the Bible, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is in the New Testament. So it's right after the Corinthians. First Corinthians, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, and then there's Galatians, okay? Galatians chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 20. Let's read it together. Whoever's still alive, let's read it together. Ready? Okay, ready? Begin. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what does it say? I am crucified with Christ. Christ died 2,000 years ago. What does it mean, I am crucified with Christ? When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he had no sin. But when he died on the cross, he was carrying whose sin? Your sin and my sin. Therefore, when God looks at the cross, who does he see? He sees Pastor Terry is already on the cross. Pastor Terry is already dead. Do you understand? No, when God looks at me, who does he see? Nevertheless, I live, but not I. It is Christ who lives in me. So when God looks at me, if I believe and I accept the truth that Jesus washed away my sin forever, from that moment on, I am wearing Jesus Christ. I am putting on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when God looks at me, who does he see? Does he see Pastor Terry or does he see Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ. So on the cross, Pastor Terry is already dead. It was Jesus who died on the cross, not me. But Jesus died in Pastor Terry's name. So when God looks at the cross, he sees Jesus is dead, or Terry's dead. But when he looks at me, he says, no, Jesus is alive. 
That's Jesus. He has Jesus' righteousness. So when God says, be ye righteous, he's not telling us, hey, change your lifestyle. Stop smoking. Stop drinking. Do this. Do that. That's not what God is saying. Be ye righteous means I already sent Jesus. He died on the cross as you. Your sins are already nailed on the cross. And I have removed Jesus' righteousness and given it, given it to who? To me. So if I accept it, then what do I receive? I receive the righteousness of Jesus. Therefore, be ye righteous means what? Do not be afraid. Only believe. Do you understand? Do you understand? Yeah. When God gives us a promise, it's because he fulfilled that promise. He cannot say we are clean if he didn't clean us. So when we know this clear heart of God, we will be able to have peace inside of our heart. So let's finish here and let's pray. Dear God, we truly thank you for this precious gospel. We thank you for the precious truth. When Jairus' daughter died, there was no other choice for people to be just be miserable and in pain. But God, when you spoke, you spoke delivering to them the world of God that they could not see with their own eyes. That world of the works of God, the world of the will of God, the world of the promise of God. So Lord, please work in the hearts of each and every one of these students to see that world of God. Lord, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.